In the headlines tonight, government to reduce water and electricity tariff to lifeline consumer. Roads Ministry and Minerals Commission collaborate to stop falling rocks from Ibri Hills. And on the foreign front, Africa's richest man, Aliko Dangote and Bill Gates announced $100 million fund to help cut malnutrition in Nigeria. Hello, good evening, and thanks so much for joining us. You're live on your own news channel, GBC 24 and Ghana Television. This is News Hour. My name is Akpene Avo Ajaja. And my name is Selike Makolachi Apollo. We are also here with our sign language interpreter for today, Clement Sam. I look at the stories now in detail. Government has agreed a reduction in water and electricity tariff to only lifeline consumers in the country. Lifeline consumers consist of vulnerable persons. This latest development follows a closed-door meeting between a government team led by Labour and Employment Minister Mr. Haruna Idrisu and the TUC led by its General Secretary General Mr. Kofi Asamoah. The percentage of reduction will be made known on Tuesday. The reduction came exactly 24 hours after a workers' demonstration calling for reduction in utility tariffs and a cut in petrol prices. Our reporter, Maurice Ogbete, has the details of that meeting. On Wednesday, workers took to the streets to register their displeasure about increment in utility tariff and petroleum product. In the lead-up to the demonstration, the government appealed to organized labor to cancel the demonstration amid plans to marginally reduce the utility tariffs. The TUC is proposing 50% cut in water and electricity charges. They are also calling on government to withdraw the Energy Sector Levies Act 899, which has occasioned a very steep increase in prices of petroleum product. After a closed-door session with organized labor on Thursday at the Flagstaff House, the Minister of Employment and Labor Relations, Harun Adrisu, announced that the two parties have tentatively agreed to offer some reduction to only lifeline consumers of utility. The government team have made a commitment in principle to organized labor, consistent with the NDC democratic, uh, social democratic uh, philosophy, to provide some further reliefs to the vulnerable under the lifeline banned protection in respect of water and electricity and we share some more detail if organized labor is also able to adjust their position from the previous uh, request for 50 percent at which negotiations have remained since then in an interview with the secretary general of the trades union congress mr kofi asamoah he noted although his side is not too satisfied with the proposal the issue will be better understood after their next meeting. At the earlier time that we met, government did not table any specific increase. Uh, the discussions were just weighing each partner, what are they with challenges confronting the partners. So as at the time that we broke off the other day, nothing specifically was on table. If anything at all today, something specific has been brought to the table. Insignificant, but we would have to discuss further. He noted, organized labor will do further consultations on whether to accept government proposal or not. We are going to do further consultation with our constituency and then we'll come back. But as I said, if, we, there should, if the, what we are asking for a reduction should not be limited to only what the PRC announced. Because the law has also brought in extra 10% increase. So we've asked them to factor all those things because at the end of the day, the consumer, what the consumer is paying is what matters and what it, not the technicalities. The percentage of reduction to lifeline consumers will be made known on Tuesday, 26 of January. Spotlight of the Public Accounts Committee was on the health sector where irregularities in the sale and accounting for admission forms to health training institutions attracted the displeasure of the committee. An amount of 352,995 Ghana cities was reported to have been properly accounted for according to the Auditor General's report. 
The sector minister, Mr. Alex Segbefia, was present when the Public Accounts Committee discussed the irregularities found in the accounts of health training institutions. In the report, it was stated that some 12 health institutions claimed that they returned 4,256 forms worth 148,960 Ghana cities. However, these institutions could not provide evidence of receipts to back their claims. Another 11 were captured by the Auditor General's report that they failed to account for a total amount of 121,080 cities, being part of the proceeds on the sale of admission forms for 4,442 application forms. The chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, Mr. Kwekwajiman Menu, expressed worry about the developments in the health training institutions. At the present moment, we have been able to create a secretariat for the training schools. They have become a secretariat on their own with clear um, management lines with their own audit section. The mechanisms in terms of ensuring that we get uniform charges for nurses who are going to be trained, uniform charges for the period of courses, making sure that the exams are sat are all at the same time, etc., etc., need to be clearly defined, and that is the need for the Secretariat. A recommendation from the Auditor General indicated that to prevent the loss of funds, all the health institutions found to be indulging in irregularities should be made to account for the missing admission forms worth over 352,000 Ghana cities. On Friday, the 22nd of January 2016, officials from the National Health Insurance Authority, Ghana Health Service, and the Ministry of Health will take their 10 other Public Accounts Committee hearing. And away from the Public Accounts Committee hearings, the Savannah Accelerated Development Authority has launched a master plan to transform the Northern Savannah Ecological Zone into a vibrant economic enclave with attention directed at poverty reduction and job creation. The SADA zone covers the Northern Savannah Ecological Zone, noted for its high economic deprivation in spite of efforts by governments to bridge the development gap between the north and the south of the country. SADA's approach to long-term planning is one we haven't seen since the 1960s. This is an ambitious, spatially oriented approach, including urban design, aimed at identifying drivers and game changers for a fundamental trans transformation of the SADA economy and social development. We welcome the proactive effort at harnessing our local expertise especially the town and country planning department, who have renewed their focus in special planning, as well as the expertise of our professional bodies, such as the Ghana Institution of Engineers, planners, surveyors, architects, and others, to work in close collaboration with one of the leading planning institutions in the world, as the Sabana International Consultant of Singapore, the Ministry of Roads and Highways and the Minerals Commission are collaborating to stop the rocks from falling off the Ibri Hills and hindering vehicular movement. The two organizations are studying the topography of the area. Hills and mountains which are embedded with minerals fall within the purview of the Minerals Commission. This is the problem area. A sedimentary rock cliff forming part of the Ibri Hills on the Pidiasi Ayimensa Road. A topographical study is underway to be followed by a geotechnical survey, all to enable reconstruction work to begin on the hills. It is a good timing that, at a time when the situation on the all important road is becoming alarming, the Minerals Commission has stepped in with expertise. Natural resources such as rocks and mountains fall within the ambit of the Minerals Commission. The Commission and the Ministry of Roads and Highways jointly did an assessment of the situation in the area. The Commission believes human activities are responsible for the problem. If we look at the rocks, we see some those black materials. Those are the phyllites. And those phyllites, any time that it rains and they get a little water even percolating into it, then that, this one becomes just like a piece of uh, cheese. 
they can just slide like that. You may even have to be looking at even though those properties on top of the ridge and see if indeed they qualify to be there or you may probably even have to spend some money, compensate them and then make sure that we have a very good clearance at the top to ensure that the whole place is very stable. The Roads and Highways Minister Alhaji Inu Safusheini described the marriage between the two bodies as a progressive one. Even from the untrained eye, everybody knows that this building is falling. Look at the angles. They're falling. But, but somebody gave the permit. So all of us must collaborate. Just like we have shown today that it's possible to collaborate to provide solutions to challenges. The decentralized agencies must collaborate with us, especially when they are building close to the road, to see whether it's safe to, to do so. The construction of this hotel, like several other properties being developed on the ridge, continues unabated. The team of roads and minerals expertise therefore took a tour of some properties hanging dangerously on top of the hill. The owner of this hotel, Nana Tupra, blamed the highway authority for blasting the rocks in 2004 during the construction of the Equiapim North Roads. If the roads were there already and I constructed this one, it is my, my own fault. Mm, but this one, the, 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 the road was there. This, the road is the road in 2004. Yes, yes. My property has been there since 2000. So four clear years before they started this the construction of the road. And uh, it, is, it is true that they possess part of this, this, uh, this land. And the records will tell them completely that they, they, they did. Mm. And they paid me for it, if they, if they, if they look through their records. Mm. So if they, if after, after the study and they think they, they, want, they have to do something about it, well, that's one. Mm. It was still a highway myself. Mm. He said he was open to compensation if this mansion would have to be pulled down to save lives. Nto Bibinimto, GBC24, Pedriase. From here, we will take you to the Ashanti region where the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Ni Osam Mills, has visited Obwase in the region in an effort to find a peaceful resolution to simmering tensions between artisanal miners and the Anglo Gold Ashanti Obwase mine. The problem centers on demands by the people to be allowed to mine on part of the mining concession of the mining giant. Anglo Gold Ashanti seems unwilling to yield to those demands. Anglo Gold Ashanti, formerly Goldfields Ghana Limited, acquired about 473 square kilometers of mining concession in the Obwasi municipality and has been mining gold there for more than 100 years. Even though the company has over the years performed some of its social responsibility, the people in the area say there must be more. One thing that remains critical to the operational communities is a sustainable means of livelihood, especially for the youth. The company therefore engaged some of the youth, but recent downsizing has hit them very hard, as many of them have been retrenched. Over the years, Anglo Gold Ashanti has also suffered serious encroachment on its legally acquired concession by illegal miners, such that occasionally the National Security Secretariat has had to intervene. But the problem persists. To meet demand and current happenings within the gold market globally, the company has shifted its attention and mining from one area to another. This seems to have encouraged Obwasi citizens to ask for part of the company's lease in order to go into artisanal mining. However, management of the company is reluctant to heed to this demand since this is their legally acquired mining concession. Unhappy about this, the people have protested on many occasions. Several efforts by some of the authorities to calm tempers has not been successful. For this reason, the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Neil Samuels, and his deputy in charge of mines, Mr. Kwabna Menka Akando, paid a day's visit to the area. They held separate meetings with management of Anglo Gold Ashanti and the leadership of the artisanal miners. Present at all the meetings were members of the Obwasi Municipal Security Council, headed by the Municipal Chief Executive, Mr. Richard Oforia Jiman. Later, the minister, his deputy, and the MCE met the media. Neil Samuels impressed on the artisanal miners to be calm as attempts are being made to address their concerns. He also noted that Anglo Gold Ashanti is already sitting about 275 square kilometers, which is about 60% of its concession to the community pending the necessary legal processes. 
prices. A mining company can decide not to mine on all the land covered by the lease. They can decide at the point in time to cut off part of the land and give it back so they will have no responsibility for it. Because in the meantime, until they do that, they are responsible for all the mine on the that is the mining operations and for activities in mining, this which fall under the lease were given at the beginning. They are in the process of going through such that at the end, that uh, decision they've taken to cut part of the mine or part of the lease off would be achieved, but it's a process. Later, the Obwasi Municipal Chief Executive, Mr. Richard Oforiajiman, told GBC24 that it was important for the ministry, with oversight responsibility for Anglo Gold Ashanti's operations, to be brought in for an amicable solution to the matter. Back in Accra, two men have been shot dead by the police at Maijo near Adenta. One of the deceased, Adesha Bagayagi, was wanted in connection with the murder of Sule Musa during last year's homo celebrations, while the second, Joseph J., was allegedly harboring the suspect. Yesterday, that is the 20th of January 2016, the police received information that the said suspect, Begaji, was being harbored by one Joseph A.J. at Majo, a suburb of Accra. The police, led by the investigator in this case, proceeded to the location and in the process of effecting his arrest, the main suspect and the person harboring him allegedly attacked the police with a machete and an axe. The police officer whose life was in immediate danger opened fire, injuring the two in the process. They were rushed to the hospital, but pronounced dead by the medical officer. Police actions so far on the instructions of the regional commander, that is Commissioner of Police, Dr. George Ekufu Dampari, the following actions have been taken so far. The police officer whose action caused these fatalities has been detained in accordance with police regulations and standard policing practices. Investigations under the leadership of the regional crime officer have been initiated into the incident. As currently, a team of investigators and crime scene experts are at the scene of the incident. And then again, the families of the deceased have been contacted to assist police with further investigations. To our very own, the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation has concluded a deal that would allow the corporation to pick feed from China Central Television, CCTV, to enrich the content of television news. In line with this development, a Chinese delegation is in the country to familiarize itself with a just-finished installation work on a server and other accessories that will form the basis for the implementation of the agreement. The tour of the six-member Chinese delegation to the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation was to enable them to find out the level of preparation of the GBC before granting them access to the feed from their television. They were received by the management of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. This visit is after two years of negotiations and preparations. They taught three sections of the corporation. At the television newsroom, they interacted with the staff of the newsroom concerning their operations. At the newsroom's control room, they were taken to the server room and given briefing on how the server works. Madame Hali He spoke about their mission and how beneficial it will be to both countries. CCTV has a very strong news gathering ability. We have over 70 overseas bureaus around the whole world. So we have uh, very good international news. We also have seven overseas bureaus here in Africa, so we have very good Africa news. Uh, we can provide all the clean news materials to GBC. All the news are 
uh, with no logos, with, vo with no voice over, GBC can use them directly into your news production. I think it's quite helpful. The Chinese TV delegation also visited the master control room, MCR, where quality control of the entire TV transmission is ensured. They inspected the server which had been installed there, as well as answered questions concerning how the server is used. After satisfying themselves with the work done so far, the delegation decided that GBC can start uploading as soon as the agreement is signed by the two parties. The family of the late David Gatte Tego has called on the management of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation to officially inform GBC about the death of the former Deputy Director General of the Corporation. The last I heard from him was when I was appointed yes. as the Deputy Director General. He actually sent me a nice congratulatory yes. message, which I found, I was touched by that. So it was like he still monitors whatever we do, the people within the broadcasting industry. And so I was quite shocked when DG told me that he had passed on. Mr. Gata Tego, a former news anchor at GBC, passed on peacefully after a short illness. Mr. Kwame Namensa is brother of the deceased. Before he passed, he had actually outlined exactly what he wanted to be done. So we met with the Ebusia and thankfully and in our own interest as children, they accepted everything that he put down. So he had indicated that he should not be, uh, we shouldn't wait too long before his burial. He has also indicated that if there would be tributes, the tributes could only come into, in the brochure, but the tributes would not be read. And there will be no tribute even from wife. He has prepared his own tribute that will be played at his biography, his biography that will be played at the church service. And he has also indicated that after the church service and burial, everything ends. The family paid a curtsy call on the management of GBC to formally announce his death. The Director General of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, Major Albert Donchebi, welcomed the family and assured them of the corporation's support during the burial. He's been in my office once or twice in the last few months and uh, he was fairly sprightly for his age. And therefore, when I got a call, uh, I was a bit taken aback. But I'm particularly excited by the, the meticulous instructions that he left behind. I can see, I want to guess that uh, the reason is to take off all this headache from, from family. That, that tells me that that should be a, a very organized person who, who is aware of the inevitable and has prepared for the inevitable. Many of us walk around lives pretending that the inevitable will not happen. Mr. Gate Tego rose through the ranks to become Deputy Director of Radio. The Director of Television, Mrs. Betty Apaopong, described the late Tego as knowledgeable and hardworking. Before I became the head of news, I was a young reporter. Any time any uh, word is mispronounced, he would call me. Even when he went to Winneba, he used to call me and tell me certain things about how words are pronounced. And the final funeral rites will take place at Winneba Methodist Cathedral on the 26th of February this year. This is News Hour Live on your own news channel, GBC 24 and GTV. We'll take a quick break when we return. Morris Ogbete will join us with the business news. Thanks for staying on and thanks to SIC, Eto and NS Chemist, sponsors of the business news. My name is Maurice Obete. Now, the managing director of the Ghana Maritime Authority, Dr. Isaka Azuma, says the rate of maritime incidents such as piracy has reduced from 74% in 2013 to 31 incidents in 2015. Dr. Azuma attributed a drop to effective security mechanisms put in place. Maritime piracy and armed robbery attacks have been on the increase in the last few years, especially in the Gulf of Guinea. The International Maritime Bureau, in its 2013 third quarter piracy report, stated that piracy in global waters is currently at its lowest in the third quarter since 2006. Although the worldwide figure is low, there has, however, been a gradual increase in pirate attacks along the Gulf of Guinea. 
In the first three quarters of 2013, the Gulf of Guinea region recorded over 40 piracy attacks, 132 crew, hostage situations and seven hijacked vessels. The region accounted for all the crew kidnappings worldwide, with 32 incidents off Nigeria and two off Togo borders. However, Ghana has been able to reduce the rates of piracy, attempted piracy, hijacks and armed robbery in the last three years. The Director General of the Ghana Maritime Authority, Mr. Peter Is Saka Azuma said the authority is working hard to ward off these miscreants from the region. Arm robbery and piracy incidents annually 72 to 42, and then now it's 31. The whole region. Now it's all because those who pass through our shipping corridor know very well that there's no way they will not be detected. If they if they cannot be detected in Liberia. Senegal, Gambia, when they get to Ghana, they will be detected. In a related development, Dr. Azuma said a memorandum of understanding has been signed with the Danish government to train more Ghanaian seafarers to work on Danish vessels. We are talking about what standard of training, what document can prove that they can be recruited, that what, uh, if the document meets the standards of international maritime organization, is it in We'll go to the Volta region and talk some banking because the National Investment Bank is set to increase its branches from 39 to 50 by 2017. This forms part of measures to bring the bank closer to its customers. The managing director of the bank, Ernest Mauli Agbesi, revealed the development at the opening of a new branch at Inquanta in the Volta region. Since its establishment in 1963, the National Investment Bank, with support from its loyal customers, have been making giant strides in the country's banking industry. The bank's prime focus has been to finance and nurture local and domestic industries. Currently, the bank offers full range of retail banking services. The opening of the Enquanta branch forms part of the bank's three-year strategic plan to increase the bank's accessibility to Ghanaians. The managing director of the bank, Ernest Mauli Agbeshi, said the opening of the Enquanta branch forms part of a strategic move to support and grow small and medium-scale businesses in the area, especially at a time when the Eastern Corridor Road was being constructed. We are hoping that by the close of 2017, we should have at least 52 branches in Ghana. The expansion of our brand networks will also generate large social benefits by promoting greater financial inclusion as an important tool for supporting economic development and the improvement in living standards of Ghanaians. A board member of the bank, John Gatti, advised businesses to take advantage of NIB's presence across the country to improve their operations. He urged the bank to pay attention to customer service delivery and to be committed in ensuring the growth of local businesses in the area. We are a true state-owned bank with the capacity to protect our shareholders and customers. We will mobilize our staff to cooperate with you to ensure all the proceeds for your farming businesses, your trading businesses, are not kept under the pillow, but they should be safely kept in the NIB branch here. Management of the bank say NIB has repositioned itself with enhanced and upgraded ICT infrastructure to meet competition head on. And still in banking, Golden Pride Savings and Loans has opened a new branch at the Kumasi Central Business District of Edum. This brings the company's total branches to eight in the country. Golden Pride Savings and Loans is a non-bank financial institution wholly owned by the Ghana Mine Workers Union. Since its inception in Obase in the Ashanti region in May 2013, Golden Pride has continued to expand its frontiers with the delivery of quality products and services. The Kumasi branch of Golden Pride Savings and Loans, situated at the Central Business District of Edum, was officially opened by the Paramount Chief of Offenso, Nanawi Afe Akenteng. This brings to eight the number of branches to be opened by the company since it started operations in 2013. The company has come to Kumasi to provide services to business operators in the metropolis. The managing director of Golden Pride Savings and Loans, Mr. Johnson Bwedi Asamoah, 
advise Ghanaians to do business with a company that is liquid and has what it takes to give good returns on investment made by customers and shareholders. Golden Pride is a financial institution that is effective in mobilizing resources and channeling them into productive investment and in support of growth. The board chairman of Golden Pride Savings and Loans, Mr. Prince William Ankara, said the way out of the challenges confronting Ghana is cultivating the culture of savings. The my business in Ghana, here they are doing about 27 million people. You see, one city a day in the year, you were saying, we can own banks on our own. The paramount chief of Offenso, Nanawi Afe Akenting, urged traders and SME operators in Kumasi to patronize the services of Golden Pride Savings and Loans. On the interbank market today, the city maintained its value against the dollar to trade at three cities. 82 pesos. It however lost 3 pesos to the pound sterling to sell at 5 cities 42 pesos and dipped by a peso against the euro to close trading at 4 cities 15 pesos. Light crude, gold, cocoa and oil lost prices on the international commodities market today. And I'll do for business brought to you by SIC, Etel, and NST Chemist. Welcome back. Now the health segment brought to you by FPAC. FPAC blows your pain away. About nine persons have so far been confirmed dead due to the outbreak of pneumococcal meningitis in the country. In the Ashanti region, one person has been confirmed dead. This follows eight deaths recorded in the Bonahafu region. Meningitis is an inflammation of the lining around the brain and spinal cord. Most severe cases are caused by bacteria. Earlier in the day, GBC 24's John Sam Arthur gave an update on the spread of the disease and measures to contain it in the Bonahafu region. The disease is still spreading um, with reported cases as of yesterday, now standing at 90 cases. You know, just the day before it was 80 cases, and two days before that it was 70 cases. So between um, three days, it's moved from 70 to 90 um, cases. But the good news is that um, the deaths were at um, 21 when the cases were at 70, and it thankfully has stayed there. 
So there's been no more deaths for some time now. The Ghana Health Service is trying to do its best, you know, to rein in the outbreak. Um, they have teams in the affected districts who are now just not sitting at their health facilities waiting for people to come in, but are going out there doing what they call active case searches, you know, contact tracing. You know, that is when a patient comes in, they try to interview the person and find out the kind of people he has had contact with, the people he stays with, the family members and other people that he might have come to contact with, to trace those people and then start, you know, educating them, putting them um, through certain tests and stuff to see whether they've been exposed to the um, bacteria. Also in health, in line with the government's quest to take health care to the communities, the authorities of the College of Community Health and Nursing at Winneba are appealing for infrastructural support to train more nurses to serve as front-line health workers in the healthcare delivery system. The College of Community Health Nursing was established as Enrolled Nurses Training School by the Ministry of Health in 1975. The school was established to train the then secondary school leavers with the requisite skills and knowledge in basic nursing care to support professional nurses in health care delivery. In 1980, the focus of the school shifted to the training of those who will be able to provide quality nursing care. The school attained a tertiary status with the introduction of Diploma in Community Health Nursing in 2005 and an institutional affiliation with the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in 2014. The student's population stands at 1,338. A total of 598 fresh students were matriculated to pursue certificates and diploma programs in community health nursing. The principal of the school, Madame Mini Okai, advised the students to avoid indecent dressing, immorality and drugs because anyone caught in these acts will be sanctioned. Having accepted to be a student of this college, you have accepted to be trained to handle controversial health issues, organize communities for action, and encourage healthy behaviors towards health promotion. The Central Regional Minister, Mr. Aquinas Steria Kwanza, appealed to the new students to take their studies seriously to enable them to become better nurses. As you leave or you stay in this school for, for that number of years of training, when you leave, Please, let your light so shine wherever you are so that at least the school or the college will still maintain its dignity. The chief of Winneba, Nyingi Gati, said nursing is a noble profession that goes with code of ethics, one of which is to avoid discrimination of patients. He advised the student to behave properly, be courteous, humane, God-fearing, and trustworthy in the discharge of their chosen profession. Upon completion, the 598 nurses will be the frontline health workers taking health services to the doorsteps of the people, especially in the rural areas, to help reduce morbidity and mortality in the country. Seven-year-old Kekeli Lani Tetefio has been given a clean bill of health following her recovery from a successful surgery. This follows a review conducted by pediatric surgeon Dr. Victor Ichure at the Children's Hospital in Accra. Lani Tetefio was born with an umbilical hernia and was later diagnosed of ventral hernia. Sarah Fori has been following Kekeli's progress and has this update viewers are cautioned that portions of this story could be disturbing. It was at Sege where I first met Kekeli Lani Tetefio. This was Kekeli then. She was born with an umbilical hernia which later developed into a ventral hernia. Organs such as her stomach, liver and gallbladder protruded through her navel which required surgical correction. In August last year, she underwent surgery performed by pediatric surgeon Dr. Victor Echiri. Her organs were tucked into place and the muscles and skin sutured to cover the organs. Five months on, Kekeli, now seven years old, 
is bubbly and well. She had come to see Dr. Triri for review. Our worry was the fascia breaking down, which would mean that we would see a little protrusion or maybe the same size of protrusion as she had before the surgery. Uh, fortunately, everything has healed, so there is no protrusion. She looks very healthy. Uh, I'm sure she's now more confident than she was previously. The scar looks okay. Um, the abdomen looks as flat as um, any young girl of her age um, will look like. Kekeli has been handed a clean bill of health. Her mother was visibly excited. I don't know how to say it. I'm, I'm just happy that the surgery is done and everything is now normal. I'm very happy. She's now eating. She eats everything. She's happy and she plays around with her now with her friends. And for Kekeli, she had her wish list. I want to be a doctor. To save other children. The first child of Michael Tetefio and Fosina Yaoli, Kekeli's journey to a healthy life may have been arduous, but this is how Kekeli got her groove back on. Sarah Fori reporting for GBC24. And that's it for health brought to you by FPAC. FPAC blows your pain away. We'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us in what's happening on the international front. Africa's richest man, Aliko Dangote, has teamed up with Bill Gates, the world's richest man, to announce a $100 million funding to help cut malnutrition in Nigeria. Mr. Dangote said the partnership between his foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation would help address the problem of malnutrition, which affects some 11 million children in northern Nigeria. The announcement was made in Abuja a day after both men signed a deal to ramp up immunization programs in the northern states of Kaduna, Sokoto and Kano. Kenyans are holding a vigil in central Nairobi for the soldiers who died in Somalia last Friday. It is taking place at Uhuru Park in the capital and large numbers of people are carrying candles and flowers. It is not yet known how many died when Al-Shabaab militants overran the African Union base in El Ad. The militants say they killed more than 100 Kenyan soldiers in the attack. The organizer of the vigil condemned the government for its response and called on officials to ensure that the families whose sons are missing are notified and taken care of. We'll be back with sports shortly. Don't go away. Good evening. Let's update ourselves from happenings from the world of sports. I'm Theophilus Sampa. This is in partnership with Tobinko Pharmaceuticals Limited, producers of Lunat and Ejapias to Nairo Betis. The Ghana Football Association says that the 2015-2016 football season will kick off on Saturday, February 20. Both the Premier and Division 1 leagues will commence on the same date. As part of preparations for the commencement of the league, the GFA has directed Premier League clubs to furnish it with nominees on the Premier League board. The Ghana Rugby Football Union is set to register all players onto the National Health Insurance Scheme for free. This is expected to boost player welfare. The game now, not like previously when players don't have the yeah. access to, do it. to, to be paid yeah. for what they <coughs> not enjoy. being paid for. They are what they are doing now. They are even they don't even care if you pay them anything yeah. because they are enjoying the game, having the airplay and having all the media men around. I mean, what the most important thing is your health issues are being taken care of. You take care of their health issues. Yes, now it's going to be happening. And we are going to register almost uh, with the help of Ghana Rugby. We are going to register almost all the clubs, a free health insurance for all the clubs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then there has been an opportunity for the players when they are being selected to participate in the national team. You go to South Africa, if possible, it works out and you are picked. You go to South Africa to go and have your trainings in South Africa. There has been some joint collaboration between South Africa and mm -hmm. Pretoria Tux, University. Tux sports. Yeah. And so, I mean, there has been a lot of development and players are happy. It hasn't been like this before. And we, the Players Association, are making sure 
he put some smiles on the face of the players because that's how most Let's go straight to Rwanda where Dia Congo continued with their ruthless form at the ongoing Chan tournament, beating Angola by four goals to two in their Group B clash and eliminating Angola in the process. The results take the Leopards on the brink of qualification for the quarterfinals, depending on the outcome of the other Group C match. A blunder by Angola goalkeeper Lalunda. Mamva gave the 2009 winners the lead after 8 minutes. Teenager Machak doubled the lead on the 18th minute before Lunda made it 3 for the break. Jacinta Diela Gilson gave Angola a lifeline by reducing the deficit on the 76th minute. But TP Mazembe's midfielder Bupi restored a size 3 goal lead with a looping header past Rwanda 8 minutes from time before. Yandu grabbed a consolation for Angola minutes later. You can catch the remaining matches live on our sister station GTV Sports Plus tomorrow afternoon and evening. That's all for sports. Hello, good evening. Time for the ad segment. My name is Valerie Danso. Our spotlight is on Diana Entry Hamilton. Her debut album, Ostro Bekasa, was released in 2007 and got her the nomination for Best Female Vocal Performance and Gospel Song of the Year at the Ghana Music Awards 2008. Diana's other release, NC We Year, received nomination for Gospel Song of the Year 2010 at the Ghana Music Awards. Um, prior to that, I had done BV and I, I had done backing vocal for Francis AJ um, as a young girl, um, about 14 years. And so I stayed with him for a very long time. Then I got married. And then, while, well, prior to getting married, I was in school and I met my executive producer whilst I was in school. Um, we went to the same church. He lived in Kumasi. I was in Kumasi doing nursing training. Um, and he was like, When you finish school, I want to produce you. And so it, it, it came and, and we did Ostrobekasa and God was good. Ostrobekasa went very well. Um, and then we followed it up with Nsiwiye, then Eyawa, and now my latest album. Um, so I don't know if we're in stardom yet, but I'm just listening to what I just sang and work in progress, Yehoah Beshe. The whole album is called Yehoah. And um, from the discussion we had, it's, it's centered around the times when I was losing my dad, the songs that came out of it. Um, so that song is out on the market. And then I have my concerts coming up. I call it the experience with Diana Hamilton. And um, I've had it done in the UK two times in a row every year I have it done. It's the first thing I the first thing, Diana. Um, and I've had a lot of calls and messages. When are you bringing it down? When are you bringing it down? And so the time is, is right. The time is right. When I get to know that people around are sending messages and saying that I'm, our songs are blessing them, it's humbling, it's challenging, it gives us the chance to go and rely on God more. So keep doing what you're doing and God will bless you. Fashion is one of the most dynamic industries. Things change very fast when it comes to clothing lines. Some of the changes give us a touch of decency, others pander to the crazy world. For instance, men's trousers has undergone rapid changes in the past four decades, such that one can fairly project a given trend. Just take a look at the following pictures and figure out where men's fashion might be going. That's it for this segment. Have a good evening.